So here I am in Pembroke Dock, which is where I live and work as a full-time watchmaker. And in this video, I'm going to give you my full watchmaker's report on the watch that you can just see coming into focus in front of you there. And that is the Vostok Komandersky. This has been such an interesting watch to review. I cover the engineering aspects, the quality, the movement and uh, the aesthetics of the watch, how to use it and also the value for money. At the end I give a full readout and score all the different aspects of this watch. So let's get on with the video. And here it is on the watch bench, a Russian Vostok Komandansky. And uh, guys, it's not this watch. Uh, this is a 19th century Fusé pocket watch, which I am just making a repair uh, to the balance. It needs a new hairspring. And trust me, guys, that is a delicate job, which requires a lot of concentration and focus. So I am just kicking back now and going to have a little bit of fun. So let's move one or two of these uh, more delicate things out of the way and open this package. Let's do it. guys is the watch and as you can see I got the lovely red version and you know as a good sign the watch is ticking away there so even that little bit of movement as we were just uh, opening the package there was enough to put some uh, power into the powertrain so you know that that looks uh, that looks good to start with um, as I say, we're going to get on to the aesthetics of this watch later. Uh, but as I take it out of the package here, you know, it's a it's a shiny, um, uh, impactful watch. <laughs> Okay, so I've taken the little plastic cover off um, the face and I've taken the watch out of the watch winder. Um, and I just want to do very quickly here a uh, an investigation onto the keyless works. And the keyless works are, of course, uh, the part of the watch that we use to interact with it, to, to set the time and to change the date and um, with some movements to stop the second hand. Um, and when you're able to stop the second hand, um, that is called a hacking movement. Now, so l what can we do with the um, stem and the crown in this common Dursky? And what do we think of it? Well, the crown uh, and the way it attaches to the stem in this watch is a little different than you would normally find. Firstly, the crown is quite wide. Um, that makes it easy to uh, unscrew. Now, normally when you unscrew a watch like this, uh, or unscrew the crown rather, um, uh, off the sort of pendant tube there, off the thread, um, as it leaves the thread, you'll see it spring out. Uh, and that's because most of them have a little spring on there, which is necessary um, because you do need a little bit of play. Um, otherwise, when you screw the crown in, you would just force the stem into the movement and everything would break. Uh, in this instance, uh, 
of Vostok have actually um, uh, designed a crown which which is kind of free to wobble around there uh, and that is that is not a fault that is deliberate in the design of this mechanism and you know there is one really great advantage to this this is possibly the easiest crown to reseat on the thread that I have uh, ever had the pleasure of using so to re uh, waterproof your watch is a simple thing to do you unscrew it it unscrews easily it's nice and wide it's nice and grippy it comes off it wobbles about okay and because it wobbles about you can it kind of really just really easily uh, put it back on the thread so that's good now in that first position you can wind the watch okay so if you listen carefully now you can hear that I have contact with the movement there okay so uh, at the bottom of the thread there's two components there one is called a winding pinion okay and one is called a clutch and you can hear the clutch slipping back over the winding pinion as I do that and that is winding the watch nicely so we're putting a nice lot of power on this so it'll be fully wound when we get it on the time grapher in a minute uh, just going on then to the last part of the keyless works um, if we pull the crown right out like that okay we then have the ability just pull it right out we then have the ability to change the time but if you looked at the second hand there um, it doesn't hack okay um, you can get the the second hand is keeping going if I actually rapidly pull the minute hand back round round you'll notice you get the appearance of the second hand uh, stopping but that is not um, hacking uh, because the whole idea of hacking is that you're able to accurately set the watch anyway that is a, a quick review of the keyless works we've got power on this watch now in summary um, the keyless works are a different design the crown sits on there really nicely it winds nicely it feels good um, but there is no hacking and no hacking is definitely a disadvantage because it's it's not so easy to reset the time accurately for your watch. Let's go on now and look at this watch on the time grapher. And there is the watch now on the time grapher. It is uh, straight out of the watch winder. And as you saw a moment ago, I put some power on it uh, via the stem uh, so it, you know the movement does hand wind I did uh, forget to mention actually when I did the keyless works um, that there is no rapid date change um, which is a little bit of a bore because um, you know when you pick up the watch if you're not wearing it all the time and you need to put the, the day forward 15 days without a rapid date change that is that is a little bit tiresome but anyway let's focus now on the performance of this watch um, we're going to turn the time grapher on in a moment. The uh, the watch is straight out of the wrapper. It's still got the cellophane on it. I don't know whether you can see that there, but it has. Um, so we're going to see now the performance, exactly how it has, has been tuned by the guys over there in Russia. So um, just one thing to point out before we do that, the lift angle on this movement, which as you remember is the Vostok 2416 Bravo movement, is 42 degrees. Now that's important because that needs to be set accurately so that we get an accurate reading for the amplitude of this watch. And we're looking for a nice high and steady amplitude. Um, because that's important for accuracy. So what we're going to do now is uh, turn the time grapher on and this is the moment of truth. See what we've got. So let's turn it on. Okay. So. The time grapher here is giving us a lot of valuable information. It's telling us that the movement is beating at uh, 19,800 vibrations per hour, beats per hour. 
um, we have a nice high amplitude. The amplitude is, you know, 279. Um, it's kind of almost exactly where you would want to see it. Uh, the B error is amazing. There is no B error. Um, the watch is completely and utterly in B. Look at it there. The B error is 0, 0.0 milliseconds. And the error in this dial up position, uh, the, the watch is only gaining one second a day. So, you know, these figures and the amplitude is rising there to, you know, 290. These figures um, for a watch uh, that cost, um, I think it was 54 pounds, um, 54 English pounds I paid for this. Uh, you know, we've got naught seconds there. We've got an amplitude of 288 and the watch is exactly in beat. Look at that. I mean, that's amazing. Um, very, very high quality watches um, are specified, you know, Rolex, uh, Breitling, Omega, you know, they are looking to come in at around under a couple of seconds a day with a B error of naught and a high amplitude. And with this Vostok, that is precisely that we've got here. We've got, you know, you should really be seeing two little parallel lines there, but actually you just got one because there's no B error. Um, the, the thing is completely in B. What I'm gonna do, I mean, this is really exciting. What I'm gonna do is uh, in my written blog um, uh, on the internet, I will publish the full uh, statistics in every position. So at the moment we're doing dial up, but um, what we could do is go down to here and do pendant right, um, uh, because we always want to check the performance in all the positions and uh, at pendant right, you can see now we've got a bit of a change there. Okay. Um, the watch is starting to gain 13 seconds a day, but that's still very good. And the B error is still pretty much at naught, although you can just see, I oh know you can just see, you're starting to see now uh, the individual beats and you've got a beat error now of 0.1 of a millisecond. That's still very good. So even in those two positions, uh, you know, if I put it back to the dial up position uh, and watch it settle back down probably uh, quite quickly you know, as the balance sits there um, and settles down. Uh, yeah. So just looking back at those figures now, I can't believe this. Look at that. That is naught seconds a day. That is an amplitude of 280. We've got no beat error. I mean, that is that is mad. Guys in uh, Russia, I take my hat off to you. Um, this watch is going to score very, very highly on performance. Um, unless, of course, we find something, you know, ghastly when we do the other positions. But I'm not expecting that. Okay, so starting to take a look now at the dial, the hands, the bezel, uh, the date window and, and all that good stuff. Let's start with the bezel because I think we've got a bit of an issue there. Um, it looks good. I think it looks good. It is uh, it is nicely sharply printed. Um, the problem with this particular example at least is the bezel uh, just spins. Now, normally, uh, you know, you get either 60 or 120 positive clicks with the bezel because it's got uh, inside the bezel, there are either 60 or 120 little teeth in there and a little spring so that you can click it round and set it. And also, it normally um, only turns in one direction. Um, now, if that was a, if this was a dive watch, that would be absolutely essential, but it isn't a dive watch, so we're we're not necessarily interested about you know running out of air or anything like that. But 
you know, it, it does have a movable bezel, but you know, the bezel just spins. So guys, um, I'm not absolutely sure whether that is the specification of this watch or whether the bezel is the springing side is just broken. Uh, now, you know, I'm no stranger to fixing bezel. Uh, if you click on the card that you can see here now, you'll see me fixing a bezel on the Invicta Pro Diver. Um, and when that was broken, it, actually, it acted pretty similar to this in that it just uh, turns around with, with no clicking. Um, so yeah, we do have an issue, I think, with the bezel, regardless of whether it's in the specification. If the specification for this watch is that this bezel acts in this way, my firm opinion as a watchmaker is that that is substandard um, and that it should be engineered uh, more effectively. If the specification is that it should be unidirectional and click either 60 or 120 times, click, 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 click like that, um, then my watch as it arrives here is broken. So either of those scenarios are not good. So if you do know what the specification is, then please put that in the comments um, because I'd be really, really interested to hear that. Also, if you have one of these watches yourself and have an issue with the bezel, then yeah, let, let, let's hear it. But now let's take a closer look at the dial. Okay, so we're getting in nice and close now. This is a real watchmaker's view of the world. Um, and immediately you can see just how crisp the lettering is. Uh, I'm guessing that's Russian for Kormandersky. And, you know, you can see the edges there on the number 10. It's all very, very crisp. The individual uh, minute markings are very crisp and the little hemispheres there of loom are very tidy. Now, I think that the main hour markers that exist, you can see there's one there at the top of the frame in the middle, um, they look to me to be not applied. Um, so on a lot of dials, you'll see the indices have two little feet on them and they locate onto the dial and they're glued in. But in this instance, I think they actually form part of the dial. And you can just see around there that there is sort of a tiny little bit of paint finding its way on to the uh, hour marker, which I guess is why in more expensive watches that you'll find them applied so you don't get that issue. Now, that is a double-edged sword because the beauty of doing it this way is that these won't fall off, okay? So just looking at that one there, um, and you can just see the light shining on it there now. That, I'm pretty sure, is never gonna fall off because it is part of the dial. Uh, I might be wrong in that. Uh, when we take the dial off, uh, I'll have a little look underneath, see if there's two feet there, because um, uh, we are going to take the dial off in a minute. Um, but no, the uh, let's have a little look. You know, we've got the uh, you know the same is true there. I think for the surround for the date window, um, but all of this is is looking very bright, very smart, and very tidy. That lettering you see there uh, I think is Russian for 31 jewels. Um, now 31 jewels is a lot of jewels to have in a watch so we're gonna open up the movement and, and see you know where some of those jewels are. But my reading of all of this is that this is a very robust, tidy and neatly presented dial uh, which is probably more resilient than a lot of dials with applied indices at the cheaper end of the range because in my experience the the cheap dials with applied indices the indices tend to fall off every so often the only thing i am seeing there 
on the second hand you can see a little bit of pain it's a little bit ragged um, uh, but we are at a very high magnification here um, so yeah not at all bad um, uh, too very good the only other issue is uh, and in the interest of time I'm not going to show you this but the hands have not been uh, applied completely accurately no let me show you I, I am going to show you let me just show you this real quick okay it's pretty pretty damn close but as you see now that minute hand is moving it's just about right in the center now but if you look at the hour hand it's just slightly misaligned okay a uh, very very small point um and it is just so close uh that and I, I you know um when you're producing a very large number of these watches to get that absolutely precise is is something that you know you are maybe just going to move on and do the next watch um and it was very very close so not really going to lose any marks for that it's my watch so i'm going to sort it out um uh, for myself okay so before we uh, open up the back and look at the movement i just want to take a little moment to look at the bracelet um the vostok have not done a bad job with this bracelet you know um Let's just move it into the light there. You can see they've taken trouble to make sure that it arrives in good condition. It is wrapped in cellophane. The outer links are brushed. Um, excuse my finger getting in the way there. The outer links here are brushed and the inner links are polished, polished. And there is a really good contrast between them. I mean, that's a, I mean, this brushing here is like, you know, that is quite uh, heavy brushing. Uh, in the sense of it's coarse and and this is very shiny um, it's almost mirror shiny if you look at that so that is that is actually really nice um also the bracelet uh has these uh little uh, buttons either side uh, which you have to push before you can open it which is good for added security so this is the sort of bracelet that is unlikely to accidentally uh, come open and uh, the watch fall off. Um, the only thing I don't like about the bracelet is the way that it sits with the watch. Um, because if you look there, there's quite a large gap between uh, where the bracelet uh, hits the spring bar at the top there and the watch itself. Um, now, at the end of this video, I am gonna put a different strap on this watch. Uh, uh, as a top tip because I think it's going to make this watch look really really good so yes yeah, stay tuned but now we're going to open up the back which also by the way um, Vostok have taken care to protect with some nice cellophane on there that you can see I'm going to take that off get some tools on it get the bracelet off open up the back and then we're going to take a look at this movement um, and this movement that seems to perform really really well so i'm interested to get get in there and and have a good look at it let's do that so the time that you can see there on the watch now is not the actual time um the actual time is quite late at night because call me old-fashioned but i figured the best time to do a quick analysis of the loom on this watch was at night so i should be in my bed but i'm doing this review and here goes. And, you know, I know the watch has been under my bright light on the watch bench here, but uh, that is that is pretty good loom. Um, that is clear and bright. Um, also, you've got the two dots at the 12 o'clock position. Um, and because you've got the date window, so you're missing a dot at the three, uh, position the three o'clock position and it's quite easy to tell the orientation of the dial in the dark so you know we could see now that the time is just coming up to looks like sort of six minutes to seven okay so uh loom from me gets a thumbs up so very quick point um Taking the bracelet off, notice that Vostok had used double-shouldered spring bars and sized them really nicely as well. So um, 
this bracelet with the catch on it and the way that it is attached to the case here with these this sort of more special type of spring bar is unlikely to fall off so that's good as well from Vostok and there is the Vostok 2416B movement and I've just spent a few minutes looking around it and because uh, I've never dealt with this movement before and I have to say that you know I, I'm impressed with this little movement uh, and I'm going to explain uh, now why I'm impressed with it uh, so let's take a closer look So firstly, the um, you know presentation inside the case. I have to say when I opened the case, I couldn't see any dust or foreign bodies or human tissue or anything else gunky in there. So, you know, that, that was a good result. Um, and I want to concentrate first on the balance because, you know, this is the real business end. Um, the powertrain is important, but, um, and the balance of course, won't be served properly unless the powertrain is good um, but then that's what the 31 joules are for uh, now of course you know looking at this balance uh, the, the sort of thing a watchmaker is going to be looking for here is the hairspring in nice concentric circles and beating um, you know outward from the center and that is looking really good to me um, you're looking for any kind of wobble on the balance uh, uh, watchmakers are obsessed with side shake and end shake and I have to say that you know I cannot perceive almost anything there is uh, you know a little bit of discoloration on the balance which is natural and that sometimes gives the feeling that it's moving around there but um, that's a maybe a little bit of optical illusion with this camera honestly when you look at it through a loop in daylight um, I can't perceive any end shake or side shake um, the two levers that you can see if I just put one in focus and in the center of the frame at the moment that is a critical um, lever because that is the uh, lever that you use to uh, move the impulse jewel uh, on the roller plate and that will um, help you put the watch in beat. Now, as we know, this watch is really, really well in beat. And you can see that that lever has got a nice sort of place for a tool to locate. So in the factory, when they do these, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a degree of automation going on to make sure these watches are in beat. Uh, and then the, the the sort of regulation of the watch, the making sure that the watch is you know not gaining or losing, that's done by effectively shortening and lengthening the spring there. So if I bring the other lever into the center and try and get it in focus there, that's the regulation lever, and there is a pin um, uh, which is presses against a a brass post at the end and traps in the spring if you can see if i just focus it now you can see the spring towards me isn't isn't moving but on the other side of that lever it's free to move and that is how we uh, regulate the watch by moving that lever uh, so that it gains or loses time now i've had another look on, on, on the loop or through the loop rather uh, at that and that is really tightly in there um, and, and accurately done so you know the real business end of this um, movement the balance is looking you know, looking really really sweet I really like it um, moving on then looking at the automatic works here um, you know these are nicely on a Rolex uh, these sort of reversing wheels here yeah, they're they're in bright purple um, we've got them in this kind of copper um, it, it looks more like copper than brass I think it's, it must be an, an alloy of brass um, but I like them they look cute um, you can see all the jewels there uh, running along the powertrain um, you know uh, keeping the friction out of the powertrain um, now key thing here is to uh, notice how much uh, uh, efforts being put into making sure the watch picks up power 
into the spring really quickly. And if you remember, the watch was beating, even though I, you know, been sat around in my drawer for ages and I just took it out and unwrapped it and uh, it started ticking away. Now that's because if we look at the rotor arm here, you can see firstly, uh, first it's great for a watchmaker. It's got a nice easy screw there for popping it off. Um, but also we've got those nice little ball bearings in there. You know, Seiko started doing that first in the, I think it was mid sixties or early sixties, maybe even uh, late fifties. Um, uh, but you know, that is nice. Uh, that will mean that the uh, rotor arm there, uh, which gives us our kinetic energy into the automatic works here, that will swing nicely. It, it moves really nicely. And I'll just see if I can show you here. Okay, so the wheel to concentrate on the one that is actually um, at the sort of tail end of the automatic works mechanism actually driving power into the spring that is this wheel here and what you'll notice is regardless of the direction that the rotor arm turns that wheel always turns in the same direction um, and that is the to achieving that is the purpose of these two reversing wheels here um, uh, but it's nicely done and uh, you know uh <laughs> doing that ain't that much difference to doing that on a rolex to be to be honest um uh so wow you know guys um i'm kind of done on the review of this movement um it has got a hod load of jewels they probably go i'm not going to pop these off but um you know, there are so many jewels in there the chance that the barrel um, itself, this is the mainspring barrel in here, well actually this is the ratchet wheel um, and underneath it uh, you will find uh, below the barrel bridge which is here uh, the main barrel um, with 31 joules uh, normally the whole powertrain including the barrel is jeweled so you know <laughs> we have got a pucker movement here um, it is nicely designed it is nicely um, implemented and uh, it, it, you know is nicely configured and it is clean and it is tidy um, I am delighted with that there we are so guys firstly I have to apologize for pronouncing the name of this watch wrong a few times in this video <laughs> it's a little bit unforgivable but i'm a watchmaker i am not a uh, expert in russian language or culture and uh, i guess if you um, are a ballerina uh, and you dance with the uh, ballet in st petersburg and you uh, want to help me uh, fill that uh, gap in my education then please feel free to uh, private message me um, why can I say that confidently um, and not get in trouble with my wife well um, between you and me uh, my wife bless her um, who is totally lovely and devoted to me uh, never watches past minute seven in any of my videos so I think <laughs> I think I'm pretty safe anyway I um, did promise you guys that I would show you this watch uh, with a different kind of strap on it. Um, uh, I mentioned that issue with the bracelet that I didn't like. So you got to love the irony here a little bit. I have stuck a NATO strap on a Russian watch and a Russian watch with some pretty heavy Soviet overtones with all that red on it as well. So. Um, I think it looks absolutely stonkingly good. So um, it's certainly how I'm going to be wearing it um, in the sun, hopefully in the United Kingdom and other places, God willing, that I'm lucky enough to go to. So yeah, top tip, whack one of these red and white NATO straps on it and it looks really, really good. Now, I have used way too much time, so let's do the scores on the doors. Now, um, here we go. 
Uh, remember, we look at this watch in three areas. Firstly, the sort of engineering and build quality and features. That's the first category. Uh, and then we look at the presentation of the watch. And finally, we look at the value for money. So let's turn firstly to the engineering uh, aspect, and that is the features that are in the watch and the quality with which those features are executed. So uh, looking at the movement, I scored the movement seven out of 10. Do you know, as a watchmaker, I wanted to score it more. I really love that little movement, but it is missing some features. Um, it doesn't hack and there is no rapid date change. And those are really two things that as a user, yeah, I really like. Everything else that it does do, it does really, really well. Uh, so I, it kind of hurt me a little bit, only to give it seven out of 10, but it gets a seven out of 10. Um, the case and the bezel, the case is good. The bezel is not so good. The bezel, the more I look at it, it's, it's tinny. The color isn't quite right on the insert. Um, so that scores the lowest of everything in this review. That is a six out of 10. The bracelet. Bracelet did much better. Bracelet's an eight out of 10. I gave you the reasons for that in the review. Keyless works likewise. Um, you know, there's no rapid date change, but I can't double clobber it. I already took that off on the movement. So the keyless works gets a nine out of 10. The loom, the loom is good. It gets an eight out of 10. Uh, crystal, I didn't really mention the crystal, the glass, um, but it's nice and it domes up there nicely. Um, it's an eight out of 10 and the dial and hands, uh, a good job with that. Um, a nine out of 10, the waterproofing, um, it's rated down to 200 meters. I think, uh, pretty confident as long as you make sure it's talked up at the back, um, uh, and the crown is screwed down. I think it's going to easily do that for you. So that's another, uh, nine out of 10. Okay, although clearly we didn't test it. And I don't recommend this watch for proper scuba diving. Okay, um, you, you, this is not a watch to take, you know, uh, down in the Red Sea at 30 meters or something like that. You want a, you want a proper dive watch for that. This is not a dive watch. Um, okay, so that when I totaled that lot up came to something like, I think, 7.7 out of 10 so you know i'm feeling good today so i rounded that up so we gave the engineering aspects the features and the quality a 8 out of 10 for this watch now turning quickly then to the presentation uh the box the the, the box is rubbish um the paperwork uh is not much paperwork there and what is um, I'm pretty sure is only in Russian. Um, could have done a better job with that. The presentation of the watch, though, was good. Um, and the only thing that really lets it down is the bezel. But I've already knocked the watch for that. So the general presentation of the watch, you know, in you know, inside the dial there and, and the whole way the watch was presented, I thought actually was pretty good. And I don't really care that much about the box. Um, so I don't wear the box on my wrist. Um, so we're looking here at a, an eight out of 10 for presentation. Maybe you think that's a bit generous, but um, no, I, I think it deserves that. Now turning finally to value for money. Guys, this watch cost me um, 54 pounds. Now I've just got to nip and go and get something. Hang on. Okay, so I just had to nip away and get a little bit of information that um, guys in the United Kingdom at least will find it interesting. And that is this. And this is a piece of paper that basically um, requests, mm, nay, demands from me um, the princely sum of £19.78. Uh, and that is a customs fee um, and a Royal Mail handling fee uh, to bring the watch into the country. Now, bear in mind that the watch itself cost me only £54. And that is a real chunk of money on top of that. You know, it's nearly 
um, 40% of it probably is about 40% of the price of the watch so um, regardless of that I am not bringing that into these figures because that's nothing to do with Vostok um, and Vostok must be judged I think on the price for the watch that they ship and I paid 54 pounds on eBay for this watch so in summary putting all of that lot together the grand total for this Vostok Komandersky watch is 8.6 out of 10 now that is a really really solid score for a watch um, that costs that amount of money and looks as attractive as the piece that you can see in front of you um, you know honestly um, there are you know Rolex date just out there ten a penny but how many do you see like this <laughs> it's not quite true but um uh, it's guys it's a good watch now if you enjoy watching my videos um, uh, then please subscribe I'm uh, trying to make the really the best content for you uh, and I would also point you to my blog and the written article that goes along with this um, and if you click on the card there now you'll be able to go and uh, visit that um, because that will have all the information on the performance of this watch in all positions so guys as I say yeah if you like my videos then please please subscribe um, hit the like button there and hit the bell so you get uh, notified every time I, I make a video I am you know trying to get my content out to as many people as possible I do see quite a lot of stuff on the internet um, which makes me giggle a little bit um, but you know if you were wanting to know about watches you, you, you could be misinformed in some places and I'm trying desperately not to do that so you know I think yeah, maybe I provide a little bit of a public service if if people can can get hold of my content so um, you can help me do that by um, subscribing and uh, liking and commenting on this video so anyway that's all that I've got I've used up way too much time probably um, but this watch I think deserved it and and the final note um, you know as a humble watchmaker here in the United Kingdom um, to my fellow watchmakers in the Russian Federation guys you did a really nice job on the movement inside this watch um, so hats off to you and that is pretty much all I've got for you guys now so um, I wish you Godspeed and I look forward to uh, seeing you or at least talking to you about watches uh, sometime very soon <laughs>